Lord, we pray that your words only be spoken and your words be what is heard. In the name of Christ, the living word. Amen. In today's reading from 1 Timothy, Paul writes, Train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has a value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So, being godly is obviously a good thing. But then he also writes, that is why we labor and strive, because we put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. So being godly is not only a good thing, being godly takes some effort on our part. Paul compares it to be like physical training. And then he uses these phrases like, set an example, devote yourself, be diligent, give yourself holy, watch closely, persevere. So you get the idea that this isn't supposed to be easy. It takes some effort. You know, when you're doing physical training, you often have a specific goal in mind, to be stronger, faster, healthier, maybe better at a particular sport, or maybe you just want to live long enough to be a problem for your children. You know, whatever it might be, you know, you have an objective. And so when we look at this objective of being godly, it's sometimes good to get a little idea of what that means. You know, and so I decided to go to that source of information that we all have learned to trust. I went to Google, and I looked for synonyms for godly, and a whole bunch of them came up. You know, it said religious, devout, pious, reverent, faithful, devoted, committed, believing, God-fearing, dutiful, saintly, holy, prayerful. It reminded me of when I was a Boy Scout and I was supposed to be trusted with a loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thirsty, brave, clean, and reverent. You know, it ends up being quite a list. And so given that, that list, the first list there, I went and I asked my wife which one she would apply to me. And she said something to me about being committed, but the way she was saying it didn't sound exactly like the way I had been using it before. Um, but regardless, regardless of that, I decided that the list was good and informative to an extent, but it was dry to, and a bit daunting to be quite frank. You know, and in the passage we just heard things like watching our speech and love and faith was also mentioned. But I started thinking godly is you know, being like God, and that, that I think is part of it. We're made in his image, and the idea of modeling ourselves after Jesus seems very, very good. But I want to be very careful because you know, there are some attributes of God that I don't want to try to assume for myself. I mean, he's the one who's omnipotent. I only think I know everything. So, um, you know, there's, there's a certain degree of comfort there. But then I thought about being what God designed us to be. And that's really where it rang for me. You know, I thought of Adam walking in the garden with the Lord. And I found a longing in my heart to get as close to that as I could while still walking on this earth. Wanting to be shaped and molded, changing the way that he wants me to be changed. 
You know, thinking about it that way, it seemed like a good place to start. So then I went back to the idea of physical training, and I thought about running. And believe it or not, I used to be a runner. You know, I was slow but steady. People would look at me, and they would say, "Well, he's making the right motions, but he sure isn't moving very fast." But I enjoyed it, and I did it until my foot and my ankle became a bit unhappy with it. And I still hope to heal up and get back to being able to do it some more. But When training for a race, you get out there and you run, but you try a variety of different things. You might run a series of short, fast sprints. You might go for distance. You might go up and down hills. You might start building up your arm strength. You might start strengthening your core. Work on different muscle groups. You might try some cross training, mixing it up a bit, getting your body stronger. From a spiritual perspective, I think it's important for us to look at, thing, at the variety of things that we can be doing, rather than staying within what we are necessarily most comfortable with. You know, we pray, we read scripture, we listen for God's voice, we try to do this regularly and faithfully, and. Sometimes I'm regular and faithful at it, and then there's other times.、Um, like runners who sometimes train in the group, we gather together, and we worship. We have Bible studies. We have Sunday school. We mentor each other. You know, all this talk about running and spiritual work has made me a little hungry. So I want to go and get a little sidetrack here and talk about. Donuts. Don't worry, it's really tied in. It's not really a digression. So, one of my favorite daughters was talking recently about taking the AATA bus to school when she was a kid. Like all of her siblings, she had a paper route. When I guess I should explain what a paper route is to some of you. There used to be a time when you got the news on a piece of paper. That was brought to your door for you, and you paid for this service. Okay,、uh, these were called newspapers, and so my kids had the experience of delivering those. Every single one of them did it, and it gave them a little bit of spending money, among other things. And in my daughter's case, she was talking about how she'd get off the bus and walk to school, and there was a bakery there. And they sold day-old donuts for a dime each. And she would often stop, and she would buy some. She would enjoy a couple on the way to school, which was necessary because she probably got up at the last minute and didn't really get breakfast. And then she would barter with her friends using her donut stash to trade different things at lunch, and always had a few for herself too. And she really loved these donuts. And her older sister, which is also one of my favorite daughters, by the way, her older sister warned her: never get fresh donuts. If you do, you're never going to be satisfied with the day-old ones. And being a smart kid, the younger sister followed her older sister's advice. For a while, but one day there was this freshly made donut that just was irresistible, and so she spent fifty cents on a fresh one, and it was delicious. What she had been enjoying up to then was just an echo of what she now experienced, and then it became hard to settle for day-old donuts after that. She found one. That she had been satisfied before, but now she had something even better. And I think you can see where I'm going with this. You know, in in my spiritual life, I can be satisfied too often with the day-old donuts. I'm going along fine. I'm doing regular things, and I don't realize that God has more for me. 
You know, in running, sometimes you get to a plateau and you just don't get any better, and it takes you a while to uh, get beyond that plateau. You can get kind of stuck there. And I think that spiritually, the same thing can happen. We can settle for less than what God has for us. You know, as you get older, you start slowing down and you're not quite as fast. In my case, I'm even slower than I was. I don't know if I was ever really fast. I'm not kidding about that. I was never a speedster. I just enjoyed running. And at, at some point, you know, I had to say, well, I'm never going to get that same time again for a three-mile uh, run or, you know, whatever I might be doing. I'm not going to get ever set another personal record again. I've peaked. I still enjoy running, but I'm not as fast. Our spiritual lives are not designed to be like that. Our relationship with God is empowered by the Holy Spirit, who doesn't suffer from plantar fasciitis and doesn't have damaged tendons or any other ailment. You know, God designed us to grow continuously. Notice there is a Another difference here between the running, there's not just the, as we mature spiritually, we don't get slower, but it's also, we're not running the race alone, ever. God is empowering us. His Holy Spirit is there. We are never alone. So the running metaphor, although useful, is imperfect. I guess you could say that the running metaphor limps a little. But, you know, another way it's useful is in the idea of the cross training. There are many, many ways to connect to God. And we have all found some that are more attractive to us than are some others. You know, I mean, I have felt God's presence on Vermont mountaintops and in dirty basements. You know, it makes me think that perhaps God is everywhere, you know? And when I'm in Vermont and I'm walking in God's creation, I sometimes get just a small sense of what Eden must have been like. Walking in the woods in Michigan is also pretty good. Uh, Ohio, my, I don't know about that, but, you know. But for me, being out in God's green forests and yes, even in the state to the south, or being on a mountaintop is a wondrous experience. It's where I see his glory, what he has created. I don't worship the creation. It draws me to worship the creator. It's wonderful. I see his hand in the tiniest little leaf. You know, the little leaves in spring that look just like the big leaves will be, only they're tiny, tiny and they're delicate, and yet, if you look at them the next day, they've doubled in size already. You know, there's just a gloriness, a glory in that. It's, you feel his presence in that. But you know, I'm here. I'm not there right now. And God doesn't call us to connect in just one little way, but in many different ways, even if there are ones that we're most comfortable with. You know, for, for you, it might be worship or in prayer, in fasting, the, in scripture reading, in scripture study, reading Christian books, in art and in music, in social action, in meditation, in a single quiet devotion in your basement, in traditions, in ritual, worshiping together in a church, in service to others, in service to the poor or the needy. There are many, many ways that we can grow with God and we can limit our spiritual growth when we don't try other things. So I suggest that we get outside of our comfort zone a little bit. For me, a number of years ago, I had a tremendous experience going down to University 
Christian, uh, uh, rather, University Lutheran Chapel on Washtenaw and serving there as an elder and then as a deacon. It was an amazing experience. I was at every worship service, almost, literally, for five or six years. And it was life-changing, absolutely life-changing. I went down there because I figured someone needed to go down there and I had some of the gifts and I'll go and I'll do it. And no one was blessed by my ministry more than I was being blessed by God. It was life-changing. It's why I'm a deacon now. You know, I, at, at times it really was like a second job, but God was there working in power and I got closer to him and became a different person. You know, Jesus wasn't somebody who was safe to be around. He didn't fit comfortably into society. He changed society. He was feeding people. He was walking on water, talking with prostitutes, eating with sinners. He made people a bit uncomfortable. And maybe if we want to be like Jesus, we need to be willing to step outside of our own comfort zones, our own little spaces. Perhaps it consists of letting Jesus out of the small space we've put him in. You know, and it might not be comfortable. It might not feel really safe. But what we might discover is that we've been eating some day-old donuts And that new flavor is life-changing.